Come on, how many believe that? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the, for the Bible tells me so. Yes, I'm preaching today from a Bible that I've, it's my, it's, it's my Bible, it's the one I read, it's the one I study from, it's, it says Holy Bible, it says Holy Bible, and it's a King James Cambridge version, and you know, it's these days, I mean, we need to appreciate how valuable this is, this is a treasure, people are talking about how AI is going to rewrite the Bible, or how China or the Communist Party is going to rewrite the Bible, it's going to take 10 years to just lie, right, and not, not really share what's really truth, and so I hold on to this today because this Bible is the source. It's where we learn about the one who loved us first, and let's imagine today that you go to heaven and you get there, and you hadn't really read the Bible. If I were to ask for a show of hands, how many have read the Bible from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, I, I would hope that more than half the congregation would raise their hands, but the chances are many of us haven't. And so imagine if you get to heaven and you're there and Peter shows you around and introduces you to some people that are there and you walk up and Peter says, hey, look at this guy. I want to introduce you. Great guy. His name is Obadiah. You say, who? Obadiah. Oh, good to meet you, Obadiah. What, what, who are you? What are you doing? And uh, what did you do in life? And he said, well, I wrote a, a book in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Oh, you know what? I really don't read much of the Old Testament. That was for the Jewish people. It's not for me. I just read mostly the New Testament. Well, man, that would be kind of offensive to Obadiah. Well, then another guy comes up. Hey, uh, this is Habakkuk. Habakkuk, what do you do? Well, I wrote a book in the Bible. Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I remember reading a couple chapters, but I got stumped at chapter three when you start talking about tithing, so I just shut it down. And then the next guy, Philemon. Uh, okay, Philemon, who are you? Are you, a, are you a Bible writer too? Yeah. Well, I, I didn't read the Old Testament. Well, I'm not a New Old Testament writer. I'm a New Testament writer. Oh, that's right. Philemon. But then the Holy Spirit comes up and says, hey, maybe you didn't know this, but these guys wrote because of my inspiration, because these holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so think of how the Holy Spirit would be offended because you as a follower, as a believer in Jesus, didn't read the Bible. So I'm just saying, this Bible tells us everything we need to know about Jesus, and it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. This guy here, he's a dummy, and he's dead. He's not alive. He, there's no power. There's no strength. He's lifeless. And so I've had this book in my library for a long time, and maybe you have a gardening for, book, a gardening for dummies book or how to build a shed for dummies. So maybe we can read this to this guy, and this dummy, and see if he'll, because it's a Christianity for dummies. Uh, can you see? So you know why this is not going to work? Because this is an attempt for people to find out about God without the help of the Holy Spirit. You know, you, you can read all the books in the world, but this is really the book for dummies. This is the book for all of us. And so if we study this book, we'll see how to live an overcoming life. And today, in this sermon, we're going to see how Jesus overcame temptation because he was the anointed one, and we also see how he used scripture to overcome that demonic temptation. So we know that we're in a battle. We know that we're in the fight of all, uh, the greatest fight of all time. It's a war against the soul. It's a war against uh, the devil himself as he tries to undermine God's authority in our lives. And so we study scripture, and we see in scripture how the Christian life is to be lived, and it's under the power of the Holy Spirit. We're enabled by the Holy Spirit to live victorious, overcoming lives. So we need to be revived, and this is summer revival. What does this word revival mean? It means to be rejuvenated, to be brought back to life. How many would be honest and say you could use some revival? You could use an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You want everything that God has for anyone in the building. First service, everybody raise their hand. Maybe all those people, maybe they weren't saved. But you know what? I think all of us need revival. All of us need the help of the Holy Spirit. And this is, you know, Jesus was full of the Spirit. Jesus Christ, the anointed one, had the tools necessary to overcome the wicked one. But see, here's what the devil is so sneaky. Satan, what Satan will try to do, and you see this in Scripture, Satan would either make us numb to the Holy Spirit or dumb about the Holy Spirit. 
You, you, can't, you can't really walk in full anointing and live in ignorance. We can't be ignorant to the Word of God. We can't be ignorant of Satan's devices. And so through the help of the Holy Spirit, now we understand Scripture so that we can live the right kind of life, so that we're not numb to the Holy Spirit. Well, what does that mean? There are three things that we can do, unwittingly do, to the Holy Spirit that's so offensive. The Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby we are sealed, sealed into the day of redemption. To not grieve or make the Holy Spirit sad. It's a heavy word. The, all, the scripture also says, do not quench the Spirit or do not put out the Spirit's fire. Another verse says about, talks about blaspheming the Holy Spirit, to which we will not be forgiven in this life or the next. So there's a lot to be said about the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people focus on Father, Son, and Holy Bible, and they kind of leave out the Holy Spirit. We would not have a Holy Bible without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brought to us the scriptures about Jesus, and the Holy Spirit helps us understand those scriptures. So we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So I don't want to be numb. I don't, I don't want to disregard what the Holy Spirit says. You know, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And so God speaks to us through his word. But we can grieve the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, you know, he, he's a gentleman. He, and, and so you're watching this rated R movie and all these F-bombs are dropping. And then someone's slitting someone's throat and then there's adultery and fornication. And we're just watching it. The Holy Spirit says, don't watch that. And we disregard that. And the Holy Spirit says that the next night and the next weekend. So we just, we, we, we want to be free from demonic temptation, but yet we bring Satan right into our homes. And to violate the Ten Commandments, and we're entertained and voyeuristically, you know, enjoying the crimes and the iniquity. This is not a religious statement I make. This is what, I believe the Holy Spirit is grieved. How many times have we grieve the Holy Spirit. I include myself and I say, Father, forgive me for grieving, upsetting the Holy Spirit. I want to have a full, complete anointing on my life. I want to live an overcoming life. I don't want to be numbed to the Holy Spirit where I have no feeling. I'm calloused and I don't want to be dumb about it. I don't want to think the Holy Spirit is so I can get my goosebump machine going into overdrive because I come to church and I have this experience and it's warm and fuzzy, but it doesn't change me to go out into the world and to be empowered to help someone else's life be changed. So, so Satan is smart. He knows how to either numb us to the Holy Spirit or make us dumb about the Holy Spirit. I think this is a strong word for the church and we're talking about revival and we need revival and reviving you know, people that are like this guy. No power, no authority, no anointing, closed off to the Word of God. There may be someone here today that you're just like this dummy. No use to the work of God. Just existing, just coming to church, sitting on a padded seat, not activating the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be this guy. I, I, you know, we need divine CPR. We need the life breathe message of Jesus to breathe life into these lungs and capture our hearts so that we can go and tell that story. That's the work of God, and that's what he does in all of our hearts. Can I get a witness in this house? We love heavy-duty heavy trucks, right? We love heavy-duty tools. Let me give you a heavy-duty scripture found in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17. Check this out. It says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. Look at this. Man, this is a slippery slope. In the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the what? Through the ignorance. Talk about dumb. Through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. He doesn't stop there. Who being past feeling. There's this numbness we're talking about. Past feeling have given themselves over, look at this, lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. You have not so learned. I mean, the Holy Spirit has taught you something different, to live above that, to resist that. We've heard of Jesus. We know of Jesus. The truth is in Jesus through the power of the Spirit. And there may be some here today, yes, you've lost your spiritual sensitivity. 
And you've given in to temptation. And, the, and so Satan's end game is not just to get you to fall or to fail, but then to condemn you and to heap more condemnation on you. You see, the Holy Spirit has not come to condemn, but to convict. That is what the work of the Holy Spirit is all about, to convict us, to challenge us, to guide us, to lead us, to empower us, to become children of the living God. But maybe some of you have have, have lost your spiritual sensitivity to where your spiritual life is down on the ground and you're just wallowing in it and you want to blame someone for your lack of spirituality, you want to blame the church, you want to blame somebody because your spiritual life, is, you got to take ownership of it. Say, Holy Spirit, fill me, flood me, guide me, lead me, correct me, convict me. But you know what? The Holy Spirit does much, much more. Wait, there's more, we should say. The Holy Spirit anoints Holy Spirit anoints us to overcome every demonic temptation. We know this to be true because it was true with Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the eternal Son of God, came to earth, walked this earth, and Satan came and tempted him. I'm reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. You can read Matthew and Mark's account. They, they all kind of overlay each other, but I like how Luke, this Gentile writer, tells the story about Jesus in this wilderness. He, he, is, he is full of the Holy Spirit, and then he's led by the Spirit. That's another thing. Some people want to be filled, but they're not going to be obedient or led. But he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And there Satan is, waiting on him during these 40 days. He fasted. He was hungry. And so Satan came to him and to, to stop the plan of God, to thwart the work of Christ. Of course, Jesus did not take the bait. And we'll see in just a minute. And we don't have to take the bait. Satan is always luring us in, in some way, shape, or form, to get us to cave in to his devices. The Bible says we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. So we know he's up to something. If we don't know there's a supernatural evil force against us, we won't rely on the Holy Spirit to be our supernatural help. So Jesus, being full of the Spirit, was tempted of the devil. He didn't cave in. Why? Because he was the anointed one. He was the Christ. You know, we talked last time, he covered in oil. It's, some, it's the symbology of the Holy Spirit. And the same is true for us because we're Christians. We are the anointed ones in an anti-Christ world. All that's in the world, the Bible says, is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. You know, first John tells us that you've heard that Antichrist is coming. Well, it's already here. So this antithesis of Jesus, the, the very opposite of the anointed one, is in this world to bring us down, to destroy our faith and our witness. But the writer of 1 John says, but ye are of God and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But the temptation that comes, that it appeals to these three areas. And you see this, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And this is kind of what Satan did to Jesus in the wilderness. Jesus is there, 40 days, the temptations are coming, and Satan says, if you be the Son of God. See, that's one of the things that Satan has in his arsenal of tricks, and that is to get you to question, he wants to tempt you to question your identity as a child of God. He did that to Jesus, and if he would do it to Jesus, he'll do it to every one of us. If you be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. You notice how he appealed to the lust of the flesh. Jesus was hungry in the flesh. He said, if you're the Son of God, you can, you can do a miracle, prove your worth, prove your power, and turn stones into bread. And Jesus, the creator of the world, could have done that. But he, you know what he said? He responded and said, it is written. And you'll see this over and over again. In this time of temptation, Jesus kept saying, it is written. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You see how Jesus, the anointed one, used the anointing and the holiness of Scripture to combat the devil. That's our only weapon. There's no other word that can rebuke Satan and cause him to stop short in his track. Other than the Bible, the Word of God, Jesus quoted Scripture. Satan came and tempted him again. He took him to a high place and showed him the kingdoms of this world. And he said, if you bow and worship me, I will give you all of this wealth because it's been handed over to me and I can give it to whomever I wish. And it was true because Adam and Eve pretty much turned the title deed of themselves, their dominion and descendants over to Satan, the prince of this world. And so he's, he's 
he's having this allurement. He's, he's tempting and enticing Jesus, who, the Son of God who had no place to lay his head, was not wealthy, saying, if you bow and worship me, I will bless you. I will give you wealth. Jesus also said, it is written, and he quoted scriptures, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. Another temptation was, hey, let's go up to the pinnacle of the temple. Throw yourself off, raise yourself back up, and you'll prove your worth if you're the son of God. So this is Satan, and what he does, he's so tricky, he's so sneaky. If he can get you to doubt who you are as a child of God, then he's got a leg up, he's got a foothold in your life. But we don't have to take the bait because we can quote scripture. We can, we, you know, blessed is the man that walks, Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, for his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water, and in his, he will bring forth fruit in his season, his leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does is going to prosper. This is the power of delighting in the Word of God because the Word of God is a weapon. The Word of, in the armor of God in Ephesians, it talks about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so Jesus used the sword of the Spirit to overcome every demonic temptation because He, the anointed one, used the anointed scriptures to fight Satan. And so do we. Here's the next thing about anointing. The Holy Spirit anoints us to live every day with unselfish purpose. When I say purpose, I don't just think, well, I've got a purpose, you've got a purpose. The unselfish purpose that we have been called to is to use the anointing that God has given us to propagate the message of Jesus to, for the benefit of others. What God does in us is not just so we can feel good in church or have this warm, fuzzy experience in church, but the Holy Spirit wants to empower you and me so that we can go and change the world. In Luke's gospel, it says, it says that the Holy Spirit will anoint you and come upon you and you will be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. So we know that the purpose of this anointing is not for us. Jesus could have used his anointing to turn stones to bread. He could have used his anointing to garner all the wealth of this world. He could have made himself, you know, show up really strong in the wilderness to prove to the devil that he was the son of God, but he didn't do that. He didn't take the bait because he came out of that wilderness experience in the power of the spirit. Read Luke's gospel. He went in full of the Holy Spirit. He went in being led by the spirit and he came out full of the Holy Spirit. In Luke 4, it says that he went to his hometown you read the whole chapter when you get home. He goes back to Nazareth, full of the Spirit. He goes into the synagogue, as was his custom. He cracked open the scrolls, the Bible, the inspired word. He read from Isaiah 61. And you know what? It wasn't a pep talk. It wasn't a TED talk. It was thus saith the word of God. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, the recovering of the sight to the blind, the opening of the prison to them that are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus, the eternal son of God, the Christ, the anointed one, comes out of the time of temptation in the power of the Spirit to come to the synagogue to read this prophetic verse from Isaiah. And he said, today this verse is fulfilled in your hearing, for this is why I've come. This anointing is not for me, it's for others. In Acts 10, 38, it says that Jesus, how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit, and he went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. See, the, see how it flips? Not only am I not tempted by the devil, but now because of that anointing, I can help others who are affected by Satan's power. You say, that's, that's not me. That's just for Jesus. What were Jesus' famous last words? After his resurrection, y'all, I'm fired up about this. After his resurrection, before his ascension, the last words, Mark 16, 17. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. The power of that anointing is for the benefit 
of others so that they can walk by faith and not by sight so that they can live the Christian life because they hear our Christian witness and testimony to preach the gospel to the poor, to see people's eyes opened to the truth of Jesus. That's what that anointing is for. It's not so that we can swing from chandeliers and we don't even have chandeliers. It's not so that we can get jiggy with it in church. Y'all, I'm pleading with you. Let's take what God has given us and let's go. Let's go. We need a Holy Go to get a hold of the church today. The Holy Ghost is the Holy Go to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You say, I, I, I don't want to do that. Well, you're just a big dummy then. Because of Jesus, look, at this. I missed this point. Because of Jesus, you don't have to be a spiritually numb dummy. Come on, can I get a witness in this house? You can come alive, you can awaken. So I want to ask you, as I close this sermon, who wants to be all in? Who wants to move forward in faith? Who wants, as I said to Brent Sunday, do you want to be under that spout where the glory comes out? Do you want the full measure of God's touch on your life? Do you just want to play patty cake for Jesus where it's Pizza Hut, ping pong, and pizza parties? No. We want to live the Christian life. We want to live the life that is full of God walking in authority where demons tremble at the mention of Jesus' name because we have that Christian authority that Christ has given us. Oh, it's, well, that's just for the Old Testament crowd. It's just for the New Testament church crowd. Y'all, we are in the last days, and I don't think that those things have ceased. I don't think God has ceased to be God in our individual lives. I, I don't believe we just have a history book here. This, this is not just a history book where we can just read about all the exploits of these. Like, y'all, we have been given everything that was given to the people of old. I say, let's, let's step up. Come on. Who's all in? Who wants to put the go back in the gospel? Lift your hand all over the room. I want you to stand with me. And this is a sacred moment right now. Will you stand with me? Let's, 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 matter of fact, how about every, every head bowed, no looking around, because I'm going to ask for a raise of hands. No one looking. I don't want to make this cliche, but I'm, I'm just asking, who needs the touch of God to awaken maybe the dead part of you, that maybe that you, you just want to say, I need, I need revival. I need not just the word, as a cute phrase, I need Holy Spirit to awaken me, to infuse me, to empower me, to equip me, to guide me, to lead me. I want to see a raise of hands all over the room. And it's just between you and God, but I'm looking, I'm seeing, man, wow. Most of this church here today just raise your hands. I want to pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this day, this extended worship moment, this time that we've been able to look into your word. Now, we take this serious, and I pray, Lord, that you would you would baptize us. You would speak to us, through us, and in us. That you would walk with us this week. Holy Spirit, I pray that we could truly have that relationship with you. Help us not to grieve you by how we live, by how we are disobedient. Help us not to grieve you by thinking that the Bible is boring. You wrote this book. If the Bible is boring to us, we're dummies. Forgive us for that. Help us to fall in love with Scripture again. Your Word is alive. Your Word is powerful. Your Word is sharper than any two-edged sword. I pray that Your Word would cut to the heart. Holy Spirit, anoint us to be students of the Word, to use it as a weapon against the enemy, and to see souls saved, to come to that saving faith in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that You would commission us to go into all the world, to make disciples. Help us to be those kind of people. And Lord, we pray this sincerely. We pray it in Jesus' name. And come on, let the church say amen and amen.